Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome back to our Water Motion series for professional advisors where today we'll be discussing the hot topic of measuring impact. My name is Ophir Zahanik and I'm the Director of Membership and Development here at Philanthropy Impact and your moderator for this series. As a not-for-profit membership organisation we exist with the aim to increase and improve philanthropy and social investment and to also encourage impact investing. We do this by working with professional advisors to private clients to increase your knowledge and skills in advising clients in their sustainability and impact journeys. We offer a unique selection of professional development events for professional advisors in this area of philanthropy and social investment and have lots of really exciting developments and training workshops available this year. So please do get in touch with me or with the team to find out more. Back to today's session. We do like to keep the session strictly to 30 minutes, which goes very quickly, but we also encourage questions and input from our audience. So we ask for this session, we ask that you use the chat function to introduce yourself, have your say, but also pose your questions to our panel. Please make sure to add panelists and all attendees if you'd like to interact on the chat and remain respectful to all throughout. Our chair for this topic is our own in-house expert, our CEO, John Pepin. And joining John, we welcome Matt Whitaker, who's the CEO of Pro Bono Economics, Patricia Hamzahi, founder of Integrity Capital, director at Extend Ventures, and co-founder of the Black Funding Network, and David Stead, who is Chief Strategy Officer at March. Thank you all for your time and insight today, and I will now hand over John to make a start. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much. I notice in the chat already there's a comment about your resting cat, Sophia. Yes, oh, that's, yeah. that's the famous Freddy. Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have a really big audience for this topic, which is really neat to see. Uh, measuring impact is really an important uh, topic uh, to uh, uh, discuss. It applies to philanthropists and social investors who want to achieve impact and to measure how they're doing. It applies to charities and social enterprises, not only just to measure their impact, but also to see if they're efficient and effective and how they can do better. And it applies to impact ESG investors uh, uh, to analyze and select investments and to see how they're doing. So I'd, I'd like to start off by asking each of the panelists to briefly explain their role and interest in this topic and why this is so important to you. So uh, David, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Um, so I guess I've been heading towards this destination for a while. I started off in capital markets, so working in the city for a long time and then became a consultant before moving to the charity sector. And at CAF, um, I was involved in philanthropy, corporate responsibility, mm -hmm. social investment and impact investing. So I got this wonderful broad view of what was going on out there. And um, what I wanted to do was really bring it all together. You know, how do you put impact at the center, at the core of organizations, whether they're foundations, whether they're asset managers, whether they're companies, you know, how do you bring it all together? Because at the end of the day, all those organizations are trying to do the same thing and it needs a systemic approach to help them to do that, which is why I joined Monsh, um, which is an early stage B Corps focused on advisory and bringing tech uh, solutions to that world of impact and impact management. Thank you, David. Matt. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as, as has been said, I'm uh, Chief Exec of Pro Bono Economics. We're an organization that, uh, as the name suggests, provides pro bono economic support to charities. We've worked with over 600 charities over the last decade or so. Um, and we exist primarily to help those organizations uh, measure, understand, and communicate communicate their impact. Um, so actually going beyond impact itself into actual economic value, what is the, the, the sort of the wider value of, of what they are delivering. So this topic goes to the heart of everything we do really. Uh, and, and we've launched um, as of December last year, a two year uh, commission, the law commission on civil society which is looking at all aspects of charities, social sector, civil society. And one of the key topics we're looking at there again is, is thinking about the way in which the market works within civil society in a world in which you don't have a price mechanism, you don't have central coordination. And it, it strikes me that, that impact is the, is the key mechanism by which we can understand what charities do, what they deliver and how they can be better at it. So that's a key theme we'll be looking at at the commission as well. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, Patricia. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I actually had a similar career path as David from capital markets to consultancy. Um, but where I'm working now is really to help what I consider social enterprises, social businesses really um, develop their sort of financial and investor proposition to make sure that, the, the, you know, that they can be held accountable to the things that they are committing to in terms of impact. And I'm also, I also work with smaller um, investors, you know, responsible um, investor organizations, family offices, who are looking to develop their strategies in investing into this sector, but also need to understand, you know, how they measure and provide evidence of their impacts. So I'm working on both sides. And I think I'm here because I'm also, I am a philanthropist myself, and I am someone who's working on, on addressing the issues of, of, of social and inequity, just understanding what the stakeholder voice, the beneficiary voice, the grantee voice is in this aspect of what measuring impact really means. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Matt, just one quick question about this um, study that you mentioned. I think it's in the chat, um, but I think there is a pre-question about uh, representation and that kind of thing. Could you address that before we move on to the thing? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the commission itself has 16 commissioners who are drawn from um, private, public and social sectors. So we wanted this not to be uh, a bunch of pointy heads preaching at the sector nor did we want it to be a bunch of charity people going to government with a list of demands. It is designed to be genuinely collaborative in bringing the sectors together. Behind that, there's then a technical panel made up of um, people working in grassroots organisations through to um, policy people working within national government designed to give us a granularity. And then there's also a people's panel, um, which is a sort of moving um, operation which is not is not fixed in its membership but is with each of the questions we want to get into we are engaging directly with um individuals and with organizations and at the moment actually have a call for evidence out uh, which is open to to everybody where we are trying to engage as widely as we can with civil society in particular to get their take on what they think the questions that we should be tackling are um and we are you know geographically diverse and lots of different experiences uh, and perspectives within the within the um, commission as well and one of the things we want to do once we're actually able to start leaving our, our homes again is to go on the road and take this thing on the road and sort of get across the uk to to find what's working and what's not working in different parts of the uk thank you matt and a reference to uh, participating is uh, in the chat for everyone so um, I'm going to start off with the questions about, are intentions good enough? Um, is there a need to measure outcomes and impact? And what's driving this whole uh, push towards it? Why are so many people, for example, attending this um, short uh, session uh, for something that a few years ago probably I would have been talking with myself. Um, so, um, and, and um, what does it really mean to measure impact? So Matt, could you address those? Sure, and, and given you know, where I'm from, given what I've already said, uh, it probably won't surprise you to, to hear me say that, um, unfortunately, I don't think good intentions are enough. Uh, clearly, you know, having passion, having dedication, having good insight is um, gets you a long way. And for me, the, the, the real strength of um, the charity sector, the social sector, is that it is um, very closely in touch with what's going on. It's opportunistic, it's nimble, it's in the DNA of um, those working within the sector to make do amend and find ways of, of um, tackling complex problems uh, and moving very quickly. But as I said at the start, it does not have the price mechanism that you have in the private sector, which helps to match demand to supply and which helps to drive innovation. It doesn't have the central coordination that you have in the public sector, which again helps to match demand and supply and ensure that, you know, depending on how good uh, your, your public sector is, uh, helps to ensure that you innovate and improve. So what we have is a sector which is extremely good at, adapt, at adapting, but um, doesn't have that coordination across it. And so there is a risk that you end up with lots of effort in one area and not enough effort in other areas and you get underrepresentation, you get overrepresentation. And so the idea of being able to, to measure impact and imposing a structure upon the market feels really important. Um, and so what you're then saying is 
for any organization coming through and clearly you know these things will vary depending on the, the size of the initiative that's in place here you don't want to sort of um, be overly burdensome but for anybody that is operating within this sector if you are here to change the world then, then clearly you need to understand what you're doing what impact it's having in order to make sure you're doing the best job changing the world and I think as a minimum what we're looking for is is some sort of logic chain so that organizations can work backwards from the goal and say this is this is the change we want to affect these are the levers we can pull and we need as an organization to be able to measure before and after what's going on and that is that's not impact that's outcomes and that's I think that's the minimum and I think that's something which charities can can do on their own you know, it doesn't necessarily always feel like a priority but I think you know it's in terms of the sort of long-term ability of the organization to deliver on its goals it should be a priority and for some organizations that's probably enough to be able to say okay we're a an organization that looks at homelessness and we are measuring how many people we're working with and what happens to them over the course of the time we're working with them and indeed beyond and from that we can we can tell a good story about um, what we're doing for many that's enough impact happens at the next stage it is saying um two key diff two key sort of extensions if you like of the outcomes it is what's the attribution and what's uh, the persistence so in terms of the attribution how much of that change in outcome that i've just registered with the the homeless people that we're working with is down to me it's down to my intervention and also is it persistent is it sustained and that's the bit which I think within organisations themselves, within lots of charities, that's the really difficult bit to do. That's the bit where there isn't necessarily the skill base, there isn't necessarily the understanding, there isn't necessarily the data. And on that aspect, I think that's where it's important that we have the, the piping of civil society, the piping of the, 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 the social sector um, being provided by others. So organisations like Pro Bono Economics, we are a charity, but we work with other capacity building organisations to try and build that, that piping so that we can support um, charities uh, as, as a group rather than asking each charity to come up with its own way of doing that. And so I think consistency is important. Having common language is important. A common way to uh, measuring these things is important. And also having a macro approach to this is important. So saying at the macro level, can we get to somewhere where we can say this is what civil society, this is what the social sector contributes to the country. And if we can start to, to, to make that case, then things can start to filter out. Then we can start to embed this idea that impact measurement actually is a really important thing for us to be doing. And that civil society and the charity sector is a really important contributor to what we do as a country. So I think at the macro level, organisations like ours making that case, at the micro level, charities themselves understanding this and funders, crucially, also understanding this. And to your, your question about what's driving it, the cynic in me would say some of what's driving it is charities competing with each other for a finite pool of money and therefore wanting to have the best case and in many cases being asked directly by their funders to prove their impact and so they do it because they have to do it. What I would like to see is going back to that very first point about how do you ensure that you want to change the world you're changing it in the best way possible that that's your motive. I think once that does become the motivation, once that's something which is embedded across the sector more generally, and funders, I think, play a really important role there in, in making that the case, then we can work collaboratively to have a common approach to the way we think about impact assessment and right. to instead of sort of making it just sort of the default position. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to some of the assumptions that underpin what you're saying because I'm sure people question some of those. Um, Patricia, um, there um, is a measurement of impact in the third sector, so charities, social enterprises, but there's also a measurement of impact in ESG impact investing. Um, what do you, and, and there's also SDGs, what do you see as how that all fits together? Uh, are they the same measurements, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I would say that on a broad level, you could say that they are similar and are looking at similar things, but I think that how they are um, evidenced in, in the real world working of all those, the different sectors, they are very different. And I would say that from a, 
um, chari charitable and um, sort of the nonprofit sector, um, what is being measured, and, and, and just listening to Matt in a way, what is being measured is um, what the, um, I would say the funders um, have prioritized, right? The funding bodies have prioritized um, as being um, the areas of impact, what, you know, whether it's homelessness or other things. And then the, the beneficiaries are, are um, sort of feeding into that process. And um, I would say that in ESG and impact, because that is driven very much from a more um, sort of established and top tried and trusted, tr tr trusted financial um, aspect, right? So, the, so, so most of the people in 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 that in the impact investing space are really using many of the methodologies, the the the, the sort of KPIs, the the metrics that um, you would find in in more traditional financial um, measurement um, area work, um, just applied to the through a social lens or an impact lens. Um, and so, I do think that's different. And the SDG, SDGs, in a way. Were, were a useful framework, that lens that sort of the investor, this, particularly the investor community could apply. Um, uh, it gave a framework. Uh, uh, and I have to say, I remember, so like in 2016, 2017, I was at a responsible investment committee, a, a responsible investment conference, a big one in Europe. And the whole audience of investors were asked, SDGs, what do you think? And almost, the entire audience said it was a waste of time, you know, wouldn't, it was too many of them, you know, wouldn't work, you know, it, was, it would take, cost too much, take too much time. And then just in some years now, you know, it be, has become one of the primary um, frameworks and lenses that is being used to measure, measure impact. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that as well. There's lots of issues around some of the SDG washing that, that we have seen, but it is still a major framework. But I would like to go back to the charity side, which is, that, you know, it is a big ask, right, for charitable organizations, particularly the smaller ones who are being asked to kind of demonstrate their, improve their impact and report on their impact. I mean, it is a big ask. I mean, they, they unlike the investment community, they don't have a lot of financial resources to put to that. So Matt's aspect of having a collaborative community in which some of that work and heavy lifting can be done is, is to be welcomed. I would only just caution that every organization and every group that's trying to make an impact is unique. And, and wh while we want to have some consistency, so we are measuring like for like in many ways, we also have to work quite hard to understand the uniqueness and the unique um, sort of level of work that those organizations are doing. And I think sometimes we do, on, on, striving for consistency means that we have sometimes really eradicated that sense of individualism and, you, you know, it's strategic purpose of, individual organizations and, them, and themselves. So yeah, that's me. Um, if we take your, what you're saying and take a look at a stakeholder, um, having a stakeholder voice, and there is a beginning, very small, early beginning of dealing, funders dealing with the power imbalance. Uh, interesting is funders dealing with the power imbalance. Um, and um, how does this all impact on impact um, analysis because of the funders driving the whole thing really is the voice of the, of the recipients being lost in that whole process. And you have uh, examples of, which I've mentioned before, uh, Isa Bosch and her approach to transformative philanthropy, you have Lois uh, Foundation, they're trying to deal with this, but how do you see it, uh, that side of it? Uh, how do they have a voice? Is the power balance so great that it will actually skew the results um, and make maths life more difficult. Um, I definitely think the power imbalance is quite great, um, and and on that particularly that that particular uh, area of focus, you know, if the if you're not asking the questions, if you're not trying to measure something that will help the organization that is receiving the funding and getting the support to improve its delivery, its operations, strategic, you know, uh, direction. If you're just asking 
um, asking questions, gathering data that just gives you your own, you know, sort of narrow metrics. You know, th that is a very, first of all, it's a very, you know, limited perspective and it probably won't take you very far. And uh, as well, just in ensuring that you have the right support and, and, um, and, and, and uh, yeah, again, strategic uh, support for, for an organization, you know, you, we need to be giving them the data. The data we collect must be data that's going to help those organizations deliver um, on the impact that they are trying to make. And I think sometimes, oftentimes, um, due to the power imbalance, that, that isn't achieved. And I think that that level of co-creation is absolutely essential. Okay, thank you. Um, um, David, um, Matt explained, uh, used the terms outputs, outcomes and impact. Uh, the latter, I think he was saying, has is, is, uh, got to do with causal relationships and the difficulty of saying that organizations deal with poverty and all of a sudden they've had this impact, whatever it is. Um, I'm simplifying your argument, Matt, sorry about that. Um, but uh, I guess, David, from your perspective, if we're talking about cause and there's hardly ever any control groups, so you can't really uh, generalize, uh, what role then does uh, data management and business intelligence play? What role does technology play in all this uh, aspect? And then also, I think there's, uh, how do you overcome the mystery of collecting and evaluating data, which in effect is uh, uh, business intelligence? And I guess I would add one more, uh, uh, which is um, if uh, most of the data that's being collected at the uh, uh, charity level is poor around these areas, uh, how do you address the issue of garbage in, garbage out? You only have three hours to answer. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of questions. Um, cool. Well, first of all, just on the last bit with Patricia, I was just thinking that where we've worked with really enlightened foundations and philanthropists is where, you know, they care about impact. And so they've invested in the organization that they're trying to fund to build up their infrastructure you know, to help them to get better at identifying, measuring, sharing their impact. So I was, my message to foundations and uh, other funders is, you know, if you think this is important, help them, invest in it, you know, build up that capability. Uh, anyway, but to your question, um, I mean, that is a big question. I mean, there's no one right answer. Um, but what we've seen across uh, the philanthropy world, the investment markets and the corporate world are some similar trends, which are that, you know, if you're not fairly pragmatic about this issue, you're going to get nowhere. You're going to be blinded by the headlights because, you know, perfect data at the moment doesn't exist. Common methodologies don't exist. You know, a perfect system to give you the answer in all situations doesn't exist. So you have to be pretty pragmatic. I think that's, that's the first point. Um, but technology can certainly help, can't it? Because Matt was saying about attribution and particularly uh, persistence, totally agree with that. But how do you keep that persistence going if the tasks are very manual, if the effort is very fragmented? You know, so you have to make it part of your system. You have to you know, make it part of your infrastructure. So, and that's why I think technology has this wonderful role to play where it can take all of this disparate data, aggregate it and start to get some structure around it so it actually means something. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that, you know, we should be taking all the possible data points in the world because then we just wouldn't get anywhere. I think this is where the pragmatism comes in. You know, what is really important to an organization linked to their purpose, linked to their mission, you know, what, is, what are the changing outcomes that they actually want to see and then work back from that point and therefore what are the key questions that need to be asked and what are those key data sets behind those questions and it might not be more than five or six, three or four key questions but then we need to get underneath that and track it on a regular basis and that's where the systems can help um, I think to build that kind of approach in. So um, you know, data is poor. Um, another thing I would say is that in all of these different sectors, that, you know, there is what we call cold data, perhaps, and what we might call warm data. Cold data is the very analytical, you know, it, it, and I think that's where ESG is at the moment. 
thousands and thousands of data point points created by thousands, it seems, of different suppliers, which doesn't get us very far at this point. Um, but then there's also the warm data, which I think is more applicable to the charities, because when you're looking at, um, you know, mental health, or if you're looking at uh, some of these really difficult, complex, systemic issues, you know, how can you really get some hard, cold data around that that's going to mean anything? So I think you've got to have a combination of that hard analytical side with what is the effect on people's lives? You know, what indicators can we find that give us at least some proxy to the change in outcome that that organization has had? And I think that's where the SDGs can help because it's not just the 17 goals on the surface, but if you drill down, you find a lot more information. Now that needs a bit of manipulation, but there's some great data in there if you know how to use it against the biggest challenges that you know society faces. Um, uh, we've unfortunately only got four minutes uh, left, um, and I think we've hardly hardly scratched the surface because you have a lot of examples of, of studies that have been done that are uh, inspiring. I mean, the work that Dave Stephanie Shirley's done around using venture philanthropy, an entrepreneurial approach, emergent philanthropy, and I mean, those are our models. And so evaluating this is really an important part of, of encouraging people. On the other side, how can you give economic value to something as, as uh, and some of the things that you were uh, describing, uh, David, and how do you tie it into long-term goals, eliminating poverty by campaigning and, and that kind of thing? There is a question in the chat, so we'll ask uh, that if that's okay. If impact is transformational, it is legitimate to talk about it at the individual level, beneficiary lives, being transformed as well as system macro level. Um, someone would, would one of you like to answer that? I jump in just on yeah. that and, and slightly think of Patricia's point as well about consistency and, and individuality, because I think it's just important for us to remember that being consistent doesn't necessarily mean putting everything into pounds and pence. Uh, and actually to David's point as well about mental health, one of the areas that we're really innovating in now is, is around well-being. And on that, the ONS have four well-being questions, which they ask very regularly of the population at large. So when we're now working with charities, we're able to say to them, let's before and after capture the well-being of the people you're working with. And then we have a ready-made control group in the ONS data, which we can compare that against. And then there's a macro case to be made in talking to government and others that these well-being measures are important things for us to care about as a society. And if you can do both of those things, you can say these are, these are things we should care about. And, and these are things which we can actually measure at the level of the ind individual charity and compare against control groups. Suddenly you've got a really powerful mechanism for understanding that what your intervention is doing in terms of changing people's lives and being able to then make a case for why that's important for wider society. Thank you. Uh, you one of you want to add something to that? I can add a little bit on that. Uh, John, all, all I'd say from my experience is that you know, again, we shouldn't get too obsessed with complexity of data because you can easily use that as a source of inaction. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of philanthropists doing fantastic work and foundations who, um, you know, really don't care too much about masses of data. They just want to know, you know, the essential KPIs and whether the change has actually been affected. And they're much more interested in the sort of people-based stories, you know, show us great examples, real examples of how people lives have been improved um, by, what, by what's been happening. So I don't think we should make the assumption that all funders are looking for this kind of perfect solution, which is extremely data driven. So that, in my experience anyway, that hasn't been the case. Okay, there's other questions in the Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, so one of them is a year or two ago at the Beacon of uh, Collaborative Awards, Trevor Paris spoke about too much attention being paid to impact. What situations do you think fall into this category? I'm going to not ask, let you answer that question because we're out of time, but it's sort of like one of those mysteries where we have a series, we'll just let it go at, at that point. And I think because of this topic is so important that we'll come back and do an hour webinar on it if, if uh, you're all okay to participate in that because it would be really great to talk about examples and to explore further some of the issues that we've just barely scratched the surface on. Um, okay, so 
Um, what I would like to oh Sophia's there, sorry I wasn't even watching the screen. Um, this is this is what I usually do come in at this point. Um, okay, so final words of wisdom. Can you do it in 15 to 30 seconds? Um, and um, David will start with you and then with Patricia. Yeah, you know, uh, impact is critical, intention is important, but if you're not going to, um, you know, look at the measurability of that and try and embed it in what you're doing over a number of years, then it's just going to fly away like another fad. Um, and the second point I'd make is let's keep it human. You know, let's make sure that it's the it's the people's lives that are being affected that's at the centre of this, and it doesn't become this kind of cold data uh, churning um, that I just don't think will help the charity sector in the long run. Okay, Matt, final words. Thanks. I think um, just in terms of motive, um, that's the important thing here that we are measuring impact not in order to make a good case for ourselves with funders. Um, but to understand what we do and whether we can do it better. Thank you. Patricia. Oh, I thought you were going to skip me there, John. Um, <laughs> real quick. So for me, impact measurement is a way of holding, a, to ensuring accountability and transparency from both the donor side and, and, and the recipient side. I think that's the balance of power when we want to talk about the imbalance, but that's where you can achieve the balance of power. But it will only be effective if that measurement is applied to strategic decision making rather than data collection reporting and sort of you know um, you know answering questionnaires, etc. It's got to drive the strategic decision making. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, um, Matt, Patricia, and David. That was brilliant. I think we will organize another one because, as I said earlier, we, there's so much more to talk about. And a lot of assumptions were uh, uh, presented here, and I think some of them should be questioned and uh, discussed. So anyway, thank you. Zofia, over to you. Just, there's just a uh, comment in the chat, which I'd like to end with, which I quite liked, from Nick Scott. He's put, this is a fascinating discussion which is taking place across the sector. I think there is some fear from charities who don't understand where to start or feel their impact will be scrutinised. Long may we strive to maximise impact, which I just thought was a very nice ending to this. So thank you all for your insight today. Next week we will be back uh, and we'll be discussing the topic of making societal change, specifically exploring the role of campaigning in philanthropy. So I'll see you there. Have a lovely week. Speak soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Everyone. Bye.